Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day three of the 41st Mill Valley Film Festival. We're so happy to have you here today. It's a very special day because we are premiering Beautiful Boy, directed by Felix von Goringen. And uh, we have an ensemble of people uh, to introduce you to. And we love this story because it's not only based locally, but it's a story that resonates universally. Uh, none of this could happen without the sponsors and the donors and the volunteers and you in the audience. But I want to give a special thanks to the sponsor for tonight's, uh, this afternoon's show, Kaiser Permanente, and our lovely Jennifer McQuitty, Vice President of the California Film Institute Board. Uh, it truly is uh, a sign of greatness when you have a film that, uh, regardless of the characters, the story, anything about it, that it could resonate in such a, an amazing way to all kinds of people. And I believe that's what Felix has done with this film. This is his sixth feature, uh, uh, including one feature that uh, was nominated for a, an Oscar. Uh, and this is, is also his first film in English. So without further ado, please welcome Felix von Groningen to the stage of the Rafael. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, having us and showing the film. Um, I, this film is based on two books, um, both written by, um, or each written by a father and a son, David and Nick Sheff. Um, and uh, they talk about their family and the struggles of, of Nick's addiction. And when I came across them and read them and, and met David and Nick, I was... Um, I was very compelled. I was viscerally moved. I had to make this movie. Uh, I thought it was um, a unique project and a very important film to make and to show. Um, um, I want to bring up some people uh, who are here with us. Uh, Didi Gardner, the producer. Playing Nick is Timothy Chalamet. And playing David is Steve Carell. We actually don't want to say much because uh, there will be a Q&A afterwards. Um, and we'll be here. Steve? But Steve? Oh, no, you're looking at me. <laughs> um, you're going to close it, right? We're, <laughs> we're very, very appreciative that you're all here today. And uh, we're all very passionate about this film and this subject matter. And we hope you feel the same. Thank you. I'd like to welcome back to the stage, and I'm going to introduce them individually because it's important. So I want to bring back the director, uh, Felix. Please come to the stage. I'd like to Gorman, Jim. <laughs> um, I'd also like to invite Dee Dee Gardner, the producer. Timothy Chalamet. And I'd like to also bring to the stage of the Rafael Film Center, David and Nick Sheff.
Well, wow. Um, I know there's going to be a, a lot of questions because this is, as I mentioned, not only just a universal themes that are dealing with it, but also a complicated, complicated subject. But I'd like to ask David and Nick, um, of course, you know, you, you wrote your, uh, your two memoirs, and I presume that was from Twig, uh, uh, correct? And Beautiful Boy. And so you, you've got to read each other's books, and this has been a while. But a movie is a different thing. It's so visceral, and you know, from the locations and in Marin, now you're at the Rafael, in Marin County. And uh, how, what was your reaction when you, when you saw this film? Um, first, Mark, uh, thank you. And uh, I just, you know, we're so lucky. I, I don't have to tell you here that we have the Mill Valley Film Festival. It's uh, extraordinary, so thanks for having us here. Um, well, it was devastating. You know, I, I um, somebody, a friend of ours said that it was sort of like our lives cubed. Um, you know, we lived it, and then I wrote about it, and then to these amazing people made a movie of it, and somehow having read it, knowing what happened, reading Nick's book, uh, and we've talked about it, you know, for years, uh, seeing it was different, and it was, uh, it was just so hard, I mean, uh, to see my son, uh, my son, <laughs> it's kind of confusing, um, in, those, in those situations, uh, you know, we lived for about 10 years, uh, when the phone would ring, and uh, you know, I just didn't know. It was uh, I just thought it might be the phone call to tell us that uh, that Nick uh, didn't make it. Um, but the other thing I felt just very quickly is that um, I felt so lucky. Um, look where we are. The fact that we can be here together, um, and at a time when you know, as we all know, um, a lot of families are not as lucky. Uh, at a time when you know, 200. People are dying every day of, uh, of overdoses. Um, so, you know, we're fortunate, and we're fortunate to these amazing filmmakers that um, they did this with such care and love. Um, yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I don't know, I just, I feel like, you know, we got so incredibly lucky with this amazing group of people that we've been able to, um, you know, just be a part of this thing is is um, such a you know such an amazing thing for us. And you know, I don't know. For me, I feel like I've kind of I, I'm not always like you know. It was ten years since the books came out, and you know, I, I work in a different field now, like I write for television and stuff. And so I'm not always like confronted with this um, with our past in such a like a you know huge way of like seeing it on the screen. And um, you know, seeing this movie, it just felt like such a gift that these guys gave to us because, yeah, it's just a reminder of, of how close we came to losing each other and, you know, I, I think they just, the movie feels so authentic to me and, uh, you know, the fact that, that we made it through and we get to be here together, I, I just couldn't be happier, so thank you guys. Uh, I want to ask uh, both Felix and Didi about the process of how this developed because uh, Didi Gardner and her partner developed this film and, uh, and there was a unique ap approach to it because there were two mem memoirs and, and I know for anyone, whether it's a producer or in your case as a director and the co-writer of the screenplay, you know, to make this choice of, uh, you're really making a choice of being involved in something for many, many years. And, and what was it for you uh, that made you kind of pull the trigger on this? So it's kind of a dual question for both of you. Would you start? And then hand it over to you, fast. Uh, well, you started it. <laughs> we've been working on this movie at Plan B for 10 years. Um, and, and what we, the thing that we thought was magical from the very, very beginning was this idea that you had two memoirs and, and two side, two experiences of, of a situation, of a family, of a dynamic, of a relationship, and how beautiful it would be if it were possible to tell this story from both perspectives. And that felt like the, the very first move that needed to be made if our ultimate intention, which is to talk about addiction and to remove shame from the room and to remove the idea that it's a moral failing, you have to actually start with its participants, not just one side. So that, that was sort of 
I guess, you know, the brass ring, but we, um, it was hard because it breaks all the rules and it's not, um, it's not something that you're taught how to do. And so we, so we struggled for many years. We didn't, um, we didn't land it. And then this gentleman came into our lives um, and we saw a movie called Broken Circle Breakdown, which is completely gorgeous. And, uh, and it made us feel the way we wanted this movie to make one feel at the end. That was the closest we'd come to an essence. And, uh, and then began our journey with Felix, who did land the plane, as you can see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, from the beginning on, was um, captivated by the memoirs by David and Nick in, in real life. Um, feeling so much love in that family, yet, yet such a raw struggle. Um, um, and yeah, the, the two points of view, trying to combine them, made it unique, made it... Um, I, I saw a possibility for, for in a very simple way to lay out something that was um, emotionally very, very complex. Um, Yet, if, if an audience could like feel it and understand it, they would have have um, you know they could start conversations coming from a place of empathy. And um, you know, the books were an eye opener for me too in in um, uh, how addiction works and how it can rip up a family or rip apart a family. And I just I was really important and, and unique. I think a film like this uh, has never been made. And in some ways, uh, you referred, Didi, to Broken Circle Breakdown, which was the film that was represented Belgium for the Academy Consideration for Best Foreign Language Film. That the, some of these are themes that you've been uh, filming about uh, and uh, thinking about and writing about for years. Um, can yeah, you uh, talk about all of those? my films deal with um, family dynamics and, and family going through hard, hard times, although there's like an enormous amount of love. Um, yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of personal reasons why that is uh, the case and also why I felt um, compelled to tell the story. I felt a lot of connection um, for personal reasons. There actually was a statement, I'm just thinking about, about another film that they said it was an impossible love story in an impossible time. And I, I think that applies to this because it really is, it's a love story. Um, Timothy, I, I, I understand that you actually got involved in this bef before I call you by my name. Uh, did you audition for this? Uh, yeah, I auditioned, I auditioned three times for this. I just figured you didn't have to audition if it was after. No, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, no, I auditioned a lot for this movie. And, uh, he worked hard. It worked, really, yeah, and uh, I had a meeting with Felix, and. I can like sometimes just go. So I was like, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm not gonna tell him how excited I am and I'll just keep my mouth shut and be normal. And I did the exact opposite. And I like, <laughs> I was scared that I scared him away. And, uh, but then we did this read with Steve Carell. <clears throat> was the last time I went in. And uh, I felt very, uh, you know, Steve like emits dad vibes. And uh, I, f I felt like, I felt taken in almost immediately. I heard that you referred to Felix as having superpowers. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. I didn't know if you fly or well, you run faster he can than literally, a speeding bullet. He can hover, which is just a... No, okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, no, hover. I guess the, the, the... I was saying, like, I feel... My favorite way of, like, looking um, on, like, working with directors is, like, I feel like a lot of the directors I work with have, like, specific superpowers. And Felix is superpower, and I feel like Didi, this is just my naive whatever way of thinking of this, like, um, is, uh, you know, you think of Broken Circle Breakdown or Belgica or his other films, and they're like, he is a superpower for human intimacy. And um, that's kind of uh, crazy to act out scenes in front of him, because he'll come over, like, with a note or a, an idea that is so, you know, hyper-specific to what is true to the human condition, what it is to be human or a family member or son or a parent or a step-parent. Um, so that's what I meant. <laughs> uh, it's the next Marvel film. Uh, so, but in terms of preparation for this film, and, and I, you know, it, it's not the first time, but certainly it's un, unusual. The, the subjects of it are here. 
And uh, how, how, did, how did you prepare for this film? And what was the, your relationship like with Nick in, ter in terms of that? Did you keep your distance? Or did you talk? Or could tell us a little bit about that. Well, first and foremost, like trust in Felix. And I think that's like very important for any actor or any moving part of a machine in a movie is like you, your director is the uh, be all end all. And it's easy when you've seen their other movies and, you're, and you really like them. So that was first and foremost. Then it was, you know, the relationship with Steve. I felt like the, the, uh, the moments of using in the movie were very important just to get the physical manifestations of that right, because I felt like if anybody ever called bullshit on that in the audience, it would be a failure in some way. But almost more important than that, and I felt where I could pull from was like the immediate context of being a son and a family myself, and Steve is a father himself. And then, um, and then in, in the time I spent with Nick before the movie, I feel like the biggest blessing and I, correct me if any of this is wrong, but it was like, uh, I just felt like we had, and I think Steve had this impression as well, like we kind of had their, um, their blessing in a way, and uh, the understanding that it's like, by the laws of reality, it was not gonna be exactly what they went through, and I cannot imagine what it would be to be played in a movie, so I just feel an enormous sense of gratitude without any hyperbole there that, you know, everything you said during or before and now that we're best friends and match t-shirts, um, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> that's, it wasn't planned, I swear uh, to God, it wasn't. <laughs> anyway. Um, obviously, Steve Carell is not here and uh, he graciously came uh, even though he had very little time to, to spend with us. Um, but he, unfortunately, he, he had to leave. Um, but David, you know, did you have, I, I like to hear any stories about, uh, obviously, uh, Steve and his relationship as a father, uh, as the father and a father, and as a great actor. So I'll start with you, uh, uh, David, in terms of did you have, uh, was everything on paper for him or did you, have uh, opportunities to talk to him uh, in further depth about the character? Or... I heard he was devastated, though, after some certain days of working, he would come home, and that one may be devastated is not the right word, but spent in a sense of going through what you did as well. And... Um, well, I think the first part of the question is if it was there before he and I met, and the answer is yes. Uh, not only did Felix, um, direct the movie, but he wrote it uh, with another writer, Luke Davis. And, um, you know, that, on the basis of that, I think Steve got it. I mean, when he and I did meet, he told me that um, he couldn't relate to this part of our story or my story, whatever it is, that, uh, you know, he had never done drugs, and I certainly did when I was growing up. And, um, but he said that he related to the fact, you know, he was a dad. And he connected with that, and he said uh, that it was the most... Um, he felt the most emotional connection uh, with this uh, character than, than he had in, in, in other movies. And uh, I think it's because he is a father. And he's got, I think he said his kids are not quite teenagers or just teenagers. And he said that, um, you know, all this stuff is on the horizon. Um, and we all know what it's like, you know, parents know what it's like to raise kids no matter how old they are. You know, I'm 62 and my parents still worry about me and freak out all the time. And, um, and when you have teenagers, you know, it's hard and it's always been hard and I think it's harder now. Uh, and so I think that that was amazing. And then when we met, um, he was, you know, what you'd all, what we all would want Steve Carell to be. I mean, he was just a sweetheart. He was the most warm, loving person in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, for me, it was just, you know, an honor. I mean, what can you say? It's just too weird for me to even think about. But it's, you know, it's, it's well, amazing. Thank you. Uh, Felix, you, uh, you co-wrote this. And... Uh, how, tell me, uh, then, and every other film you, you wrote yourself as well, um, but how did, and, and Dita, you can weigh in on this too, how did it start out, was, was it always that you had uh, acquired both rights to both films and that was always the intent and, and you, you came in at that point and, and, and worked with another writer? Yeah, um, yeah so Luke Davis um, co-wrote this, Luke wrote uh, Lion, and um, he, um, he also wrote a book, Candy, which was turned into a film, and which was a portrayal of his own addiction. Mm -hmm. Luke is a recovering addict. He's been sober for 20 plus years. Um, and we, it, you know, the, adapting one book is already hard. 
Um, so uh, two books was 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 just even harder, uh, mostly because of just the volume. There was there was I mean, David and Nick talked about the same period, but they each had their point of view, and there were just so many. Uh, scenes that interested us, so much material that interested us and that was very cinematic. I think both David and Nick are really um, gifted writers and write very cinematic, actually. Um, so it, the process was really boiling it down, um, uh, taking our time to see where the characters' uh, arcs intersected and what was important. Um, one of the ideas from the beginning and what is also in the movie now which works, I think, is that you spend lot, chunks of time with one character um, so you can really go into his experience and, um, and, and, and not like cut back and forth all the time. So you, you follow David, you, follow his in, you experience his anxiety of not knowing where Nick is because the audience, as the audience uh, uh, doesn't know it as well. Um, at other moments, you go along with Nick for for like a long time, and you see how he relapses without David knowing this, and and with that information come back in the family situation. Um, but uh, yeah, it took it took four drafts. Uh, it took a long time uh, again to to boil it down because there was so much material to really get to the core of it. Well, it worked. A good decision. Uh, shall we open it up for some questions from the audience? Okay. Uh, well, we'll start right here. I'm going to repeat the question. The question is, how did you use the music? I mean, there was a number of different relapses, and how did the music affect the storyline as well? As I... um, well, f first of all, I would like to say about the, the repetitive nature. That was one of the, 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 the major or, or the hardest things to tackle because it, it is uh, what makes this story really authentic. It also is it made it hard because, you know, it, it is predictable or it could be predictable in a movie and, and you could, as an audience, lose your interest. So the, the way to go about it was to have the characters learn along the way about themselves, um, uh, about one another, so see the relationship change through these relapses and have them learn about what addiction is and means. Um, as far as the music, uh, it, uh, the, the very eclectic uh, use of music was, was, was really inspired by the books and by, by David and Nick, uh, by their shared passion for music um, and by their eclectic taste. They, ha they have a lot of quotes of songs that they use uh, in, the, in their books. So organically, it, 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 came, it, it, it became part of the script with the Nirvana moment and the uh, singing the beautiful boy and... And, and yeah, in the post-production too, we, we kind of you know went along on that path and, and used music to um, uh, make um, score the soundtracks of their lives. Other questions? Um, let's see, anyone up? Yes, right over there, the woman in the red. First, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you said. And uh, uh, the question uh, was, uh, after saying some very complimentary things about the film, 
is that uh, the, the effects on the siblings, you know, and that was very evident in there as part of the plot of the, of the movie. Um, maybe as obviously, David, you can comment on that and Felix as well. Um, yes, uh, everyone in the family is affected. Uh, there are these cliches that you hear, uh, hear when you're, you know, when you start to go to treatment centers and talk to doctors, psychologists, and you go to rehabs, and um, one of them is uh, addiction is a family disease. And at first, I didn't get it. I said, you know, no, this is not our problem. It's not our family. It's Nick's problem. But very quickly, I learned, and anyone who's been there knows, uh, we were all affected, and it was traumatizing for everyone. And I hear all the time from families who are going through this, and a common theme is uh, just the disruption, the chaos, the anger that comes when somebody is addicted. And people tell me all the time, parents tell me, you know, I cannot ever imagine you know, trusting my child again. Or, or kids will tell me, um, my parents won't speak to me anymore. You know, is there any hope? And I guess what I would say is that um, we know that there is hope because our family um, is closer now than ever. Daisy and Jasper, uh, who are now 22 and 24, and Nick all live within five miles of each other in Los Angeles. They're together all the time. They go to the movies. They surf together. They hang out. They have dinner. Um, so, you know, yes, it's traumatic. But, you know, there's a, another cliche that, you know, that which doesn't kill you, kills you, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You can't say it. But, um, and it's true. When you go through something like this, it is hell. Uh, but when you come out the other side, you appreciate each other more. You appreciate life more. Um, Nick, do you have any thoughts um, about that? Well, actually, I did want to think about one thing about that, which one of the amazing things I think about Timothy's performance in the movie is I feel like you see the way that that character, which is me, but the character is like holding these two things in himself at the same time. Like one is that he's like, you know, full blown, like, you know, um, addicted to the drugs and, you know, is lashing out and behaving in this completely like, irrational way and stealing from his little brother and sister, which is something that I did, and breaking into his parents' house. But what Timothy brings to the movie is you also see that there's just this incredible amount of like guilt and shame that is always present. So even when he's at his worst, that guilt and shame is there. And you know, that scene in the in the diner when or the coffee shop where they're talking and you know Steve or my dad or the whatever brings up <laughs> The, um, you know, just brings up his little brother and sister and he lashes out immediately. It's like, that felt so real to me because that was always there. Like, even when I was at my worst and I was, you know, I was behaving in such an insane way, like, that love was always there in me too and the guilt and the shame was always there too. And I, I just, I don't know how Timothy did that. Like, the fact that he was able to hold all that into one person as an actor in a movie, I, I, it blows my mind, but um, I definitely think it, it's worth noting, so, yeah. Um, actually, that scene, for, for me, from being a different generation, uh, reminded me of James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause, and uh, this is a compliment. It, it, it's uh, fantastic, and uh, you as an actor, and Felix as a director, to to have that kind of honesty and complexity in that scene and throughout the movie is just a testament to two great artists. So thank you. Yes, gentleman here. Really, thank you for saying that. And um, you know, I, I went to performing arts high school in New York. I try to highlight that as much as I can. And that's, I guess, the only thing I can really muster back to something so nice is that I've had really the most amazing teachers, and and in public education too, publicly funded. You know, and uh, I wouldn't be here without that. So, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from here on this side? Yes, the young woman in the back. Yes, you. <laughs> Could you shout it? Could you stand up and shout it out, please? Um, I have a question. First of all, I thought this movie was amazing. Like, really, really close to home because I was in the Bay Area and I was there for the
Did everyone hear that question? Good projection, good projection. But the, um, man, I really, really like that question because it felt like the one trap of this role, particularly at a young age, was to lean into this idea that, um, that, I, that I would have to like sit here promoting the movie and tell you how I hurt myself or something. Um, I think there's a certain pressure on actors now. People like wave their flag of struggle to warrant their work in some way. And, uh, and that was the gift of Beautiful Boy, the book in many ways, and Tweak as well, but I felt like you really got a sense of that in Beautiful Boy was um, the humanity of it all. And that's almost what I feel like the movie gets at, which is, it's the terrifying thing about the movie, which is like, this, is, this affects everyone. And so to that point, I thought, the worst thing you can do is think like, okay, how, how am I gonna play this now, and, or be an addict? And, and um, without being so cavalier as to like, you know, it was tough shooting this and it was tough losing weight and everything, but it was never gonna be what um, Nick and David actually went through or what, or what people go through when they go through this. Um, but then there were the books that were there too, that, that was like a roadmap, you know, and working on a movie uh, last year too that was based on a book, that was different, that was fiction, but, um, you know, and then just, just trying, again, it, like one of the things I kept in my head in this movie was like, look for the light, and that was like kind of a mantra in my head because I thought, again, as an audience member, it's easier to tune out if you're like, well, this is not my life, like this, I can't recognize this. But when, if you can watch it and you go, oh God, like this is, um, for people that have gone through this or are in proximity of it, whatever, if you, that, that felt like the goal. And then I don't wanna rant too much, whatever, but like the, um, I feel like movies that deal with this subject matter in what I've seen, which is really probably like very small, but they, they tend to tragify it like even with the t color tones of the movie or something, or they'll make it really raw and real or something, or like train spotting, it'll be like hip or like fast cuts or something. And what I think the tension of this movie is, is there isn't that hint in any way. And that's what the ending I like so much about it, is it's, you know, you think it's gonna be something really horrible or really great, and instead it's like, this is what it is. And I don't wanna speak out of turn at all, but my understanding of addiction too is that you don't really win the fight, it is a day at a time. and. Uh, and um, now I've totally forgot what you asked me about. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, right in the back. Hi, um, I noticed in the credit roll that there, you incorporated the artwork that was really made by Theron and, um, and the, the illustrations in the journal by Jasper. And I was wondering if you could talk about those choices. Um, <clears throat> I think what what was um, amazing for me to uh, working on this project was uh, how organically I got closer to the chef family, how they um, let me into their lives. Um, I, I saw Nick quite a bit. I I, I came uh, to Marin to visit David. Um, stayed over, uh, we had long talks, long walks. Um, and so I, I got to see how they lived. Um, I, I knew a lot because of the books, of course, already. But then to experience it was, was really amazing. And um, organically, that just became part of the movie. Um, we went up there again with part of the crew, production designer, DP, um, costume designer. And, and, and they too connected really with David and Karen and um, that's how you know, organically it came about that we asked Karen if we could use her paintings. Uh, Daisy's artwork is also in the movie um, and, and, and Jasper was working as a PA on the movie and the <laughs> art department like, had seen his drawings and was like, yeah, can you? Can you do this? Could you do next journal? And um, and he did, and it was incredible. There was a woman in the corner who's been waving frantically. That's you. <laughs>
Don't worry, I don't let them forget. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, there was uh, Amy Ryan and Mayor Attorney. Mayor Attorney. Um, quick cut on for a couple more questions uh, at the most, right here. It's just pretty expensive. The question is, yeah, about the rights That's to the songs. Basically, but uh, sometimes you also write letters to the artists, and they um, and and they, you know, they um, uh, offer a great deal, I guess, because they like the project, think it's important. Um, but some songs were pretty expensive. So it's like buying a home in Marin. <laughs> anyway, I want to give you a chance to, to before we. Close. Is there anything else, uh, Felix, or any of you would like to say? Uh, um. Mostly, thank you for coming on a beautiful day. We're really grateful to, that you're taking the time to see it. It's well, it, it's it's our pleasure from the artistic sensibility that the actors and Timothy and and you as the director have brought to this, and and your perseverance with this DD. You may not know that DD is a uh, co-principal with the company Plan B that we've had many of their films here, including 12 Years a Slave. So uh, we, we look forward to the trajectory of this film. Uh, do we have an opening date we can talk about yet? November 12th? October 12th. Oh, okay. Please tell your friends and thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nick. Thank, thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Thank you.